All right. Video off. All right. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining in on the Marine Institute Graduate Society seminar series. We're excited to get back into the swing of things. Uh, we have a list of great speakers coming, but we need to fill out the schedule a little bit uh, before releasing the monthly posters like we normally do. So for now, it will be one presenter at a time. Uh, this semester, we already have some seminars coming on ecology, genetics, invasive species, and population dynamics with some big names, uh, professional and uh, academic. So before I introduce our guest speaker, we'd like to provide a land acknowledgement for Newfoundland and Labrador. We respectfully acknowledge the territory in which we gather as the ancestral homelands of Beothic and the island of Newfoundland as the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and Beothic. We would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nanetsiavut and Nanetikavut and the Innu of Natasinan and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with all the peoples of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. So please join us in welcoming Dr. Jeffrey Hutchings as today's seminar speaker. Dr. Hutchings is a professor and an Isaac Walton Killam Memorial Chair in Fish, Fisheries and Oceans at Dalhousie University, which is a prestigious appointment um, acknowledging his research. He actually graduated from Munn in 91 with his PhD in biology. He quickly followed that with a postdoc at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland before returning to Canada to teach at Munn and Dalhousie, eventually leading to this, into the position that he's in now. Uh, to paint his work with a broad brush, uh, Dr. Hutchings studies evolutionary ecology, although his research touches on pop dye, behavior, life history, and so on. Uh, he actually published a book last year titled uh, Primer of Life Histories, Ecology, Evolution, and Application. So if uh, ecology and evolution is your thing, you might want to check that out. So with that, I am pleased to introduce from Dalhousie University, Dr. Jeffrey Hutchings. Great, thanks very much, Colin. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, well, <laughs> it's not a pleasure to be here where I am, but it's a pleasure to be able to communicate to you, uh, having indeed been a master's student in your position and organizing seminars at in, in Newfoundland. Um, I commend you for taking on this task. Anyway, it's uh, great to see so many names um, of people who I've known in the past and thinking of the past, um, I'm going to, uh, wait a minute now. Boy, isn't this classic, you know, we use PowerPoint daily throughout our lives, but the speakers are always are pressing the wrong buttons. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I am reminded of people who, uh, who were seminal in my formative years at Mon in the 80s and 90s. Uh, John Gibson, Dick Hadrick, who was my master supervisor, Doug Morris, my PhD supervisor, Ram Myers, who I collaborated with for 25 years. And um, I'm reminded also that it's 40 years now since I started my master's uh, working in Terranova National Park on, uh, on the use of lakes. Uh, by uh, Atlantic salmon, and that was kind of a big question back then, still is to some extent today, is, uh, is to what extent do young salmon utilize the lacustrine environment, and how important is it from a life history perspective? After uh, grad work in Newfoundland, uh, as Colin said, I went to Edinburgh, returned to Newfoundland, worked at DFO, um, and uh, that was uh, an interesting time for me. And uh, I've just uh, actually written an essay, uh, sort of an invited essay or, or paper on, that covers some of that period of time of Northern Cod, uh, published yesterday morning. <laughs> um, and, uh, but again, here's a couple of people that, don't, uh, that aren't around anymore, Ram and George Lilly in the figure. But I'd also point out, as Colin said, thank you, Colin, um, that I, have spent the last couple of years writing a book on life histories, life history evolution, and I would say that that stems ultimately from my time period at Memorial uh, from 1982 when I was didn't really know what life histories were, but um, uh, it certainly got me interested in the topic. So I'm going to say something very briefly about this book uh, towards the end of the talk. Uh, prior to that, I'll say something about regime shifts, some ongoing work. It's not yet published. 
uh, regime shifts uh, in sea survival of Atlantic salmon in Canadian rivers. I'm going to start off with uh, what I would call conditional regime shifts and work on Norwegian Atlantic cod. Uh, but before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about northern cod to set the stage. Northern cod, of course, as many, if not most of you know, uh, has a fishery that was has been around for 500 years. This is a catch reconstruction that Ram Myers and I did a few years ago and we've since updated it. Um, but it clearly indicates not only the, the long temporal span of the fishery, it identifies a couple of periods where the fishery expanded. One was the northward expansion to Labrador uh, by schooners, so the schooner fishery. And then of course the uh, influx of the new stern trawlers in the late 50s and 1960s, uh, primarily from Europe. And from the early 60s to the early 90s, Northern Cod experienced a decline in spawning stock biomass of perhaps as much as 95% over a fairly short period of time, only 30 years. In fact, I guess it's 30 years ago this year uh, that the moratorium was announced. Now, the most recent information on Northern Cod based on DFO's fishery independent surveys indicate um, a sort of middling um, trajectory, I'm not sure trajectory is the right word, um, but since it's relatively high biomass index in the 1980s, followed by a period of uh, extremely low levels of abundance in the 1990s uh, and early 2000s, we have seen, uh, some people have called it a recovery, people, some people call it a comeback. I say, I call it, you know, it, it, it's a, a turn in the right direction, but it's, a, it's stalling right now. But the point I want to make is that Northern Cod is still well below its limit reference point, but the limit reference point is simply the average spawning stock biomass in the 1980s. And we can ask the question, well, you know, has that become our target now? Uh, we seem to be in this sh shifting baseline scenario where we've kind of forgotten what it used to be like. Um, some colleagues of mine at the University of British Columbia and in Germany, um, including Daniel Pauly, who, who characterized the shifting baseline uh, point. Um, if we look at a, a reconstruction of the northern cod spawning stock biomass, B, relative to the stock biomass that produces maximum sustainable yield, often considered to be a, a sort of a target uh, in fisheries management, the 1980s uh, were rather modest uh, spawning stock biomass relative to what the stock was, what we estimated it to be in the 1940s and, and, and early 60s. And if we uh, reconstruct what B over BMSY might have looked like, looked like over the last 500 years, it puts the 1980s into yet another perspective. So this, I think, Taking a long temporal time frame, a long historical look at things is rather important when trying to understand present day processes. And so let's go to the 1989 to 1994 period, um, because this is the period that immediately preceded uh, the collapse, uh, preceded the moratorium on Northern Cod. And there has been a sort of a regime shift narrative that has evolved over time uh, with respect to that period. Uh, and it started with the uh, assertion that the timing of the cod collapse in the early 90s was associated with unusually cold water temperatures. And there's hints in the literature that cold water kills cod, ergo cold water killed cod, and that's why we had the collapse. And um, this is indicative perhaps of a regime shift. Unusually cold water temperatures are perhaps indicative of other ecological unusual things that would normally have not occurred. And that's an important question to explore a little bit. And indeed, if we just look at the sea surface temperatures recorded at station 27, just off St. John's, uh, oh, from the uh, mid 1940s to, in this case, up to 2006, uh, that period of the uh, late 80s, early 90s was a cold period at the sea surface temperature. 
But there are two other periods that look uh, rather similarly cold. Um, and I would note that if one goes below the sea surface and uh, looks at temperatures at deeper depths, uh, the cold anomaly from 1992 or 1991 um, disappears. And this is also true if one looks at a much longer, takes a longer temporal lens. These are from the uh, Hadley, a global sea ice and sea surface temperature database. You can easily look this up. Uh, these are the sea surface temperatures uh, recorded around St. John's, around Station 27, from 1900 to present day. And again, you can see that that period of the early 90s, uh, yes, it was cold, but not cold relative to what it was like in the first uh, 30 years of the 20th century. Um, and this kind of a pattern uh, is also evident if, if you look at other indices as illustrated in the top three panels that Ram uh, Myers and I published in 1994 such that if we look at water temperatures on the Northern Grand Bank, uh, look at ice clearance data off Hopedale, Labrador, that's the second panel, or the third panel, the air temperature in St. John's from the 1870s onwards and air temperatures being significantly correlated with water temperatures, that the early 1990s uh, were cold, but they weren't unusually cold relative to what Northern Cod have experienced in the past. And so clearly, the cod stock experienced similarly cold temperatures in the past, if not uh, colder, and for longer periods of time, but the stock did not collapse. And there were not dramatic reductions in catches that we might think would be associated with that. However, one thing that did um, change, one thing that was different was that in the early 1990s, the late 1980s, the cod stock was far smaller than it ever had been previously. So the focus on cold water and purported correlates thereof had the effect of diverting attention from the influence that small population size per se can have on collapse and recovery. And for some reason, this rather important point seems to be missing in various narratives about collapse and recovery of northern cod. We have myriad examples, and you can do, you can run simulations that will show you that small populations are more susceptible to natural, naturally occurring environmental change than large populations. So small population size makes things more susceptible to environmental change in temperature, food supply, species interactions. And the more susceptible a population is to unpredictable environmental change, the greater the variability in mortality. Not a good thing. If things become increasingly variable in terms of mortality, that can be problematic for population persistence and viability. And an excellent paper about this on marine fishes was published by Colleen Minto, now in Ireland, uh, during his PhD at Dalhousie in Nature in 2008. We also know from both empirical and modeling studies that the greater the magnitude of population reduction, the longer and the more uncertain the recovery period. So again, this is a focus on the magnitude of depletion of populations and the extent to which that makes them more susceptible to regime shifts, to environmental change, um, so, one narrative that I might suggest is that declining population size and high fishing mortality, coupled with potential uh, distributional population shifts, may have amplified, this is the key word, amplified any effects of cold water and other naturally occurring environmental variability on the productivity of northern cod. In other words, if colder water and other potential environmental correlates affected northern cod deleteriously, that was conditional upon the depletion that northern cod had experienced. So the point being then that small populations are more susceptible to environmental change than large populations. Northern cod have not recovered, and northern cod are not alone in this respect. There are many depleted marine fishes worldwide that despite reductions in fishing mortality, 
have not recovered or have shown very uncertain or limited recovery, but they certainly haven't matched our expectations um, such that once we remove fishing pressure or most of the fishing pressure, we haven't seen fish species bounce back up. And again, I come back to this point that it seems to be that those species that do not recover or do not recover rapidly are those that experience the greatest reduction in population size. But regime shifts is a narrative. We, there is a regime shift in the Northwest Atlantic. It's a, norm, it's a regime shift predicated by unbelievably high levels of fishing mortality and extraordinary depletions over three decades by many top predators. So I would suggest that uh, if one wishes to think about regime shifts, you cannot exclude fishing from that narrative, from that discussion. Uh, fishing has an extraordinary influence on ocean ecosystems. But let's turn to regime shift. What constitutes a regime shift? Well, this can be sometimes a problematic term. It sometimes seems to uh, depend upon who is using the term and how they wish to use it. But in any event, what constitutes a regime shift was a, a, an issue uh, or a, a point of departure for an, explore, an exploration that I undertook with colleagues in Finland, uh, Tommy Perala, who is a postdoc at the University of Uvescula, and Espen Olsen, who is a research scientist with the Institute of Marine Research in Norway. And what we did is we applied um, some algorithms that uh, Tommy had uh, had experience with to time series data on cod productivity and potential drivers of cod productivity in southern Norway. So this element, this question that I mentioned about what constitutes a regime shift is a rather important one. So regime shifts uh, are used and have been used uh, in the context of uh, kelp uh, uh, deforestation, if you will, or the, uh, the grazing or the raising of kelp by sea urchins, as indicated on the left of this figure. When talking about coral bleaching, uh, there's clearly a before and an after. And I think, again, visually, one can uh, could justifiably call these regime shifts. Um, but when you've got time series data, such as what's illustrated here, uh, these, this is the winter index for the North Atlantic Oscillation. This is a, a climate index uh, thought to be representative or to reflect climate um, in the North Atlantic. Uh, when you've got time series data, it becomes a little <clears throat> uh, unclear or potentially unclear as to what constitutes a regime shift. So what Tommy and Perala and Anna Kukorina did in a paper in 2015, is they simply defined a regime shift as an event that drives the state of a system over a critical threshold, after which the qualitative behavior of the system changes. And I think that is a great definition that fits the coral bleaching, the um, sea urchin grazing uh, regime shifts quite well, and it can also be applied to time series data. And the way that they applied this definition to time series data is by uh, capitalizing on the fact that time series data are, can be characterized by changes in the mean over time, but also in the variance in the data over time, such that one can uh, define a regime shift a little more uh, quantitatively as occurring when there is a sudden and persistent shift in the mean and or the variance in time series data. And the way in this uh, is done for uh, these time series data is through what's called a Bayesian online change point detection algorithm. And this is an algorithm that, um, at least the way that it, it, it works, it, it, it basically it's an algorithm that updates itself as you move along the, the time series. So the algorithm continually and sequentially updates 
what's called the posterior probability distribution since the most recent regime shift with the posterior probability distributions of the parameters of the data generating process. So you basically, you're running through this time series. You've got parameters associated with the mean and the variance. And this algorithm is such that using Bayesian methods, uh, it detects changes in the mean and or the variance uh, in this time series and does so in a sequential uh, fashion. So basically then a high probability of a change point in the time series, which we would uh, identify as being a regime shift, results from poor compatibility of the model prediction with an observed data point. So you've got a new data point or a new set of data points. They're not compatible with what came previously as determined by the posterior predictive density function evaluated at the new observation. So I put these words here simply for those of you who are familiar and comfortable with um, time series analysis from a Bayesian perspective. But let's move on to a couple of things that are perhaps more readily understandable and are certainly important in this type of an analysis. And that is that there are two key parameters in undertaking this type of regime shift analysis. The first is called lambda, which is the expected frequency uh, with which a regime shift would occur. In other words, you set this parameter uh, based upon your expectations of how often a regime shift might occur for the variable of interest. So this NAO, the North Atlantic Oscillation Index, some people have identified a decadal oscillation. Uh, so you might set lambda at 10, so we, such that there's this expectation uh, of a, a regime shift might occur, doesn't have to occur, might occur every 10 years. Or perhaps for other variables, you might set lambda at a shorter or longer period of time. Meaning that when you run this type of analysis, you need to do sensitivity analyses to evaluate the degree to which your regime shifts um, are dependent on lambda. The other parameter of importance is m, the minimum length of each regime. So this is another input uh, parameter um, such that you provide some expectation about how long you think a regime would last if there was a shift. Now, it turns out that the outcomes are not that dependent on M, but they are on lambda. So let's apply this algorithm to the NAO time series to give you a feeling for how it works, at least what the output looks like. The output as seen here um, shows you the NAO winter index on the y-axis uh, from the 18, what is it, the 1860s uh, to uh, the early 2000s on the x-axis. Here we've got a lambda of 10. So the expectation of a regime shift here is every 10 years. The minimum length of the regime shift is, is also 10 years. And what the algorithm has done is it's identified by different blocks of different colors of gray. Um, those represent different regimes. And uh, you can see the data points um, quite clearly. The uh, black horizontal lines represent the uh, average uh, uh, value of the NAO winter index in each of those regimes. So you can see then how this algorithm can create output that allows you to identify regime shifts based upon changes in the mean and or variance of the time series. Now, that is, as I say, what it looks like at a lambda of 10, meaning that you think uh, your expectation a priori is that uh, regime shifts might occur once every 10 years. If you instead change lambda to 15, 20, or 25 years, um, it changes uh, your perception of, of how many regimes there are and when those regimes uh, occurred, at least in this case, what it's done is it hasn't changed 
uh, the more recent regime shifts so much, but it's definitely collapsed what appeared to be a lot of regimes earlier on in the time series. And if we are highly conservative with a lambda of 50, meaning our expectation of a regime shift would be twice in a century, uh, then uh, we wouldn't detect any regime shifts at all. So again, my point here is simply that um, the utility of this method does depend on your, uh, your choice of lambda, thus necessitating a, a sensitivity analyses. Okay, that's the method. Let's go to the data. Let's apply this method to the data. And uh, suffice to say that all the sensitivity analyses uh, associated with this are in, in the paper in question, uh, published in, in PLOS One last year. Um, and I'll show you the, the, the key outputs here. So the data represent data from a beach seine survey conducted in, in what's called the uh, Skagerrak, Skagerrak uh, between Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, uh, along coastal Norway. Uh, these have been ongoing since 1919. Same boats, same gear, uh, same methods. Uh, the people have changed. Um, and the boat has changed, but the design uh, has remained the same. And when applying this algorithm to the um, to the juvenile cod uh, catch rates, and these are, it's important to note that we're talking about cod that are in their first, second, or third year of life. Most of them are zero plus and one plus age, that um, there are two regime shifts in terms of the mean uh, catch rate. Um, Interestingly, you can see how there's two uh, regimes identified from 1919 to 1975. Uh, the means don't differ, but the variance differs. I'm going to leave those and focus on 1974 and 1999. So in 1974, the juvenile cod catch rates declined by 45% uh, relative to what they were from 1919 to 1975. And in 1999, they declined by 75% relative to what they were in the past. So this algorithm then identifies two regime, um, well, one, two, three regimes with uh, two regime shifts. So let's apply now the same algorithm. And I think this is kind of a strength to this approach that I personally like. We apply the same methods that we're that we're, we've applied to try to understand to describe changes in cod, cod productivity. Apply the same methods to the putative drivers of cod productivity. So, what are the potential uh, drivers of these um, these regime shifts? Uh, and another way to ask that question is: Were there regime shifts in putative drivers? let's say two to three years earlier than the cod regime shifts. Remember, we're talking about cod that are in their first, mainly the first or second year of life. So you can ask the question, is there a regime shift in a putative driver that occurred a couple of years earlier? That might then be a driver of these 1974 and 1999 regime shifts. So let's look at food, Calanus finmarchicus. Uh, there are data from the uh, continuous plankton recorder surveys uh, in this part of the world uh, from 1958 onward. And the algorithm has been applied to those data and we can see that there are uh, some regime shifts, four different regimes identified in the time series. Uh, but if we look at those regime shifts for Calanus finmarchicus, the first regime shift occurred after the 1974 cod regime shift, uh, which would which made us think, well, it occurred after, so it couldn't have been a driver, it couldn't have been responsible for the cod regime shift. However, the second cod regime shift in 1999 was preceded uh, two or three years earlier by quite a reduction in the amount of calanus. So perhaps that cod regime shift might have been influenced by food supply. We can look at temperature. So we have water temperature going back to the 1920s uh, in this part of Norway. 
and um, they're measured in this case at, at a one meter depth at Fleur de Vegan. And um, what you see here are time series for January, for basically the first half of the year. And what this uh, uh, algorithm identified are, it's a single regime shift for each month. So each month has the same regime shift, 1988, a one to two degree increase in temperature. So remarkably consistent output, um, irrespective of the month in question. And um, so we can ask the question is these, but to what extent did this regime shift result or influence the COD regime shifts? Well, these regime shifts occurred in 1988 uh, after the 1974 COD regime shift and well before the 1999 regime shift. So this is as so though this warming regime shift uh, influenced uh, these juvenile COD. However, if we look in the latter part of the year from July to December, um, we see that there again, uh, typically a, a single regime shift was evident uh, somewhere between 1994 and 1999. Again, it's about a one to two degree change in that regime shift, and it's a warming. Now, this might have had, a, as a reminder, there is that second regime shift in 1999 where the COD uh, catch rates were reduced. Maybe that was uh, predicated by warming uh, of the water uh, prior to 1999. And some of that water um, yeah, the COD regime shifts were 74 and 99. Some of those, some of this water temperature change is pretty dramatic. So let's just look at August. So we're talking about average temperatures in the month of August in excess of 20 degrees. Um, you know, of course, nothing like that is ever seen around Newfoundland. It is something that is seen around coastal Norway, but 20 degrees. Um, that's getting close to uh, a rather stressful temperature for COD. Uh, so it's quite plausible then that unduly high temperatures might have affected COD survival. What about fishing? Ah, that old, um, the old thing about fishing mortality. If you're going to look at regime shifts in, in the productivity of something, you need to look at regime shifts in fishing mortality as well. In this case, fishing mortality estimates are available for the North Sea, of which Skagerrak is considered to be part of uh, from a stock assessment perspective. And independently of what your lambda is, uh, these uh, are the regimes that the algorithm uh, produces. Um, such that, And we have some recreational fishing mortality in the Skagerrak. Uh, from 2005 to 2013, when F was about 0 0.8, uh, 0 0.9, uh, so pretty high. And I should also tell you right now that the cod stocks are so low in southern coastal Norway that they've closed the recreational fishing uh, for the last three years in that area. And at the highest point, uh, fishing mortality was three times F MSY a very high level of fishing mortality. So we have regime shifts in fishing mortality. Fish, uh, we have regime shifts in temperature, colonists, and cod. And we can combine them all together in uh, just in a simple plot, I think. Um, and first we can look at, or, or we can make the observation that some regime shifts occurred that had no effect on cod, or at least appeared to not immediately precede cod regime shifts, making the point that regime shifts potentially can occur without any obvious consequences to biological productivity. The NAO regime shift in 1961 um, was well in advance of the cod uh, reduction in 1974. Uh, zooplankton of Calanus finmarchicus uh, was reduced by 75 percent in 1982, um, but there wasn't an obvious uh, reduction in cod immediately after that. Water temperatures increased um, in 1988. That didn't seem to affect the cod. 
Similarly, we've got increased water temperatures and a regime shift in zooplankton in 2008 that don't seem to be temporally associated with the pod reduction regime shifts. However, if we look at the regime shifts that plausibly or that did immediately precede COD regime shifts and um, plausibly uh, were causal determinants of those COD regime shifts, uh, then we see that um, the first COD regime shift was uh, preceded by a regime shift in fishing mortality, an increase an increase in the NAO index, and in the North East Atlantic, uh, an increase in the NAO index is predicted to be associated with a reduction uh, in cod abundance, especially young cod. So here we've got the first regime shift in cod has been preceded by two, uh, by regime shifts in two putative drivers that occurred close together. And the second regime shift in COD in 1999 was preceded, preceded by several regime shifts. Uh, temperature increases, zooplankton reduction, the NAO went down, which uh, in theory uh, is supposed to lead to an increase in COD. That didn't happen. But the point here is simply to make the observation that the COD regime shifts seem to have occurred after multiple regime shifts were experienced in putative drivers. I would note also then that the fishing mortality uh, throughout this period was steadily increasing to extremely high levels and that the second regime shift uh, of cod occurred when the cod was at a low level. In fact, uh, the second regime shift of cod preceded by multiple regime shifts of putative drivers occurred when the spawning stock biomass of cod was below its limit reference point, uh, drawing attention to the potential vulnerability of small populations to environmental change. So we called these uh, conditional probabilities of regime shifts such that fishing mortality, in this case, appears to be a fundamental overarching importance in sensitizing cod to environmental regime shifts. We concluded that the consequences of an environmental regime shift are magnified when it coincides with other regime shifts. So when you've got multiple regime shifts occurring at the same time, that can be increasingly problematic. And we also concluded that environmental uh, regime shifts are more likely to negatively affect cod productivity when the cod populations are small. So that experience in dealing with cod regime shifts and potential drivers uh, led me to think that this was a potentially useful uh, method or algorithm to apply to questions related to the um, to, to survival of Atlantic salmon at sea. And this is work again done with colleagues at the University of Uvescula in Finland. And I also want to acknowledge Sebastian Pardo, who was a postdoc of mine uh, for three years. And the fact that this work was uh, importantly funded by the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation. So now, with respect to um, salmon, Salmon mortality at sea, it, the prevailing narrative is that salmon mortality has gone up over the last uh, two or three decades and is a, a problematic element in terms of the recovery of Atlantic salmon. And there is an, a narrative, I think it's fair to say, of spatial synchrony and spatial coherence in salmon status. Here are two recent papers um, uh, that point draw attention to the spatial synchrony um, in the response of salmon to climate change and in the lower paper, paper evidence of spatial coherence and time trends of life histories. So this narrative of spatial synchrony uh, also comes with it, uh, the implication that if we have common patterns, if salmon populations are experiencing common patterns, there is presumably a common cause responsible for these patterns. 
And so from a survival perspective, we might think that if they're experiencing common patterns in survival, that can be mainly attributed to some common cause in the ocean. And for Canadian salmon populations, we might then look to the um, Labrador Sea and west coast of Greenland, where uh, salmon are known to overwinter and to um, inhabit the same area, a common habitat, independently of what rivers they came from. So common patterns, common cause. If there is a common cause, one might well look to this area for that common cause. Now, the papers that I mentioned that talk about or identify the spatial coherence um, use what's called um, populations based on these ICES stock units. So ISIS is the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea. And what the working group has done there is to amalgamate data from different populations and classify them into these stock units. Uh, the challenge, however, I, I would say for someone who's not part of the working group and a member of the public, uh, I think there are a few issues associated with this amalgamation into these stock units. Um, first of all, by doing so, it presupposes that the data from one river to the next are roughly comparable, which is unlikely to be the case. Because many population estimates, especially in Europe, are based on catch data. So we can ask the question, how much are based on catch data, which can be somewhat unreliable as a metric of of abundance or fishery independent data for which we have means, particularly in Newfoundland, of drawing some estimates. How many populations are sustained largely or entirely by hatchery reared salmon, which has some issues in terms of uh, relating those changes to uh, populations that are not influenced by hatcheries. And the lack of information on smolts can lead to the assumption that stock recruitment dynamics do not differ among populations. In fact, that's the assumption made in Norway, um, that the stock recruit relationship is the same for all populations in Norway, except they only have small data, that's the period of time salmon are migrating to the ocean, of 100 and roughly 190 populations that they assess, they have small data for only one population. So there are problems with some of those analyses, I would suggest, which is why we focused on estimating uh, at-sea survival estimates based on data uh, for populations for which we have both smolt data and uh, returning adult data. And there's only seven rivers for which though that sort of gold standard exists, and, that, and those seven rivers are indicated in the map here. And uh, those, and what we did is we estimated uh, survival using the hierarchical Bayesian maturity schedule module. And all you need to do really is to focus on the um, time trends in the rivers. You can see in some rivers, such as the Camelton, their period of survival seems to be increasing the first year at sea over the last, uh, at least in, in the 21st century whereas it declines overall, seems to be evident in the Con River, St. John River, uh, St. Jean River in Quebec uh, appears to be increasing. The point being that there seems to be some differences among the populations in terms of the trends in survival. So are these patterns synchronous, which is what the ICES work suggests? Um, in other words, do, do the populations express similar patterns of regime shifts? It's another way to ask this question. So we applied this re regime shift al uh, algorithm that I mentioned earlier to the survival data for salmon at sea. So what do those outputs look like? Well, here are data for the Con River. Um, Con River is located on the south coast of Newfoundland. And um, this algorithm produced two regimes for the Con River, showing a reduction uh, in survival at sea. Uh, so it, it identified two regimes 
and you can see what they are here. And on the y-axis is, es is the estimated survival probability at sea, and of course the x-axis is year. Um, and I'm not going to, if you want to know what the lines mean, they have to do with the marginal posterior distributions. Uh, you, we can talk about that later, but I, uh, if a question arises, uh, but I think let's just focus on the trends for now, because that's perhaps I, I, at times slipping away. So um, I don't want to spend too much time in the methodology. So the con, so the analysis indicated two regimes in the con river, one regime shift and things generally not looking too good. The same type of thing was observed for uh, the population uh, Trinité, also on the, on the in the Gaspé, quite a long ways away from the Con River. Again, two regimes, one regime shift in survival. However, if we look at a nearby river, the Saint-Jean, near to the uh, uh, Rivière Trinité, um, instead of two regimes, we see three regimes. And in the Saint-Jean, we see that a, a regime in later years indicative of of improved survival at sea, something that we don't see at Trinité, which we might have thought maybe we would. If we look at Western Arm Brook on the Northern Peninsula, uh, this is the one with the longest time series of uh, data on smolts, and no regimes are, are uh, pop out uh, from this methodology. In other words, according to this methodology, Western Arm Brook has not changed its survival probabilities at sea since uh, the uh, early 1970s. So the point being then that for these seven populations for which there is arguably the gold standard in terms of salt and returning adult information, by applying this um, uh, Bayesian online change point detection algorithm uh, to the survival data, we end up with different patterns. Uh, in other words, they're not synchronous. They don't appear to be spatially synchronous. Are, some populations seem to have similar numbers of regime shifts in similar directions, but others do not. And so taken together with Pardo et al work, uh, this suggests, um, at least it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't seem to support or the contention that there is spatio-temporal coherence in survival trends. Um, and it raises the question, perhaps our shared stressors at large spatial scales, or it raises the question of whether uh, our, shared, our shared stressors at large scales more influential on sea survival than local stressors at smaller scales. And I think this work is suggesting that smaller scales might be um, the place to look, such that some conclusions from the salmon work is that populations appear to differ in the number of survival change points, the timing of regime shifts, and the directional trajectories of mortality at sea. Uh, shared stressors, uh, perhaps once influential 30 years ago, may have diminished over time. Um, so things that were important in the early 1990s might not be important anymore. Um, uh, thus magnifying contemporary effects of local or regional stressors, aquaculture, low abundance, predation, climate change. And uh, so such that I think, uh, we think that the prevailing narrative of broad temporal and spatial synchrony in salmon survival may not pay sufficient attention to smaller scale sources of mortality and differences in life history. And with respect to this point about life history, um, two minutes simply to say that um, my work, my graduate work in Newfoundland led me to be incredibly interested in life history evolution. And uh, over the last couple of years, I've, been, I've documented this uh, tremendous increase in uh, research on, on life histories um, over time uh, and uh, punctuated by several important papers and several uh, very useful books. The most recent book though was in 2002 and two of the other books were 30 years ago in 1992. That got me thinking, because uh, I hear the term life history used in a lot of different ways, uh, 
lately, and I wondered, has the concept of what constitutes a life history become increasingly or unhelpfully diffuse? And that perhaps there's utility in re-clarifying life history evolution, reconfirming its foundational elements and drawing attention, uh, not only to its foundational elements, but to the ways in which um, life history, knowledge of life history evolution can be applied to uh, conservation biology and sustainable exploitation. I went to Northern Iceland to uh, start working on this book and I wrote the first chapter there. It's this house, it's a replica of a 13th century building. And it, I realized during that period of time that if I'm thinking about life histories, I can't just be thinking about one organism. I'm thinking about multiple species and multiple organisms. And I found some fantastic artwork by a fellow in Cornwall um, that really captured what I was trying to uh, capture in this book. And so you can see that there's multiple species inside this running hair. And this has become the cover of, of the book, which is a primer of life histories. It's targeting undergraduates, people who have some familiarity with math, but they don't need a lot, uh, some familiarity with genetics, but you don't need a lot. It's trying to get people interested. And for those of you who are interested in applications, perhaps this is the more novel part of this book, uh, but I do spend quite a bit of time on illustrating how uh, life history, a knowledge of life histories, a knowledge of the foundational elements of life histories can be applied to things of interest to extinction, exploitation, and climate change from a conservation perspective, and to illustrate how integral a knowledge of life history is for sustainable exploitation. So um, I hope you will accept that small uh, plug for this book that might be of interest to some of you. And with that, um, Thank you for your attention, and I'll stop there. And happy to take any questions. All right. Um, yeah, great. Thank you, Dr. Hutchings. Do we have any questions? Uh, we have. We still have a few minutes for questions. You can go ahead and uh, raise your hand in the in WebEx um, or type in the chat. Uh, while we wait for other people to raise their hand, let's see. You make sure it can be hidden sometimes. I do have a question about uh, Lambda. Um, <clears throat> you were talking about how you know it's really important and it, it can change. Uh, so for like some sensitivity analyses and stuff like that, I was I wasn't really sure how it was built into the algorithm, but I was wondering if you build uncertainty around that. If you can build uncertainty around Lambda. Yes, in fact, there is uncertainty around Lambda. Um, so each of those parameter estimates uh, comes from uh, or is part of, uh, has its own distribution, shall we say, its own priors and um, and its own posteriors as well. So I, the short answer is yes, you can for each, the lambda is not a, a fixed parameter when applying the algorithm, it is one that is, uh, that is allowed, uh, allowed to vary around uh, the mean. Okay. And um, also, is there a way to find maybe more appropriate um, in general lambdas according to maybe like ecosystem size or latitude or temperature or habitat types? Is there like a general rule of thumb for lambda, like coral reefs compared to? Uh, I don't, I don't think so, Colin. I don't think so. And I think, I think one could certainly, um, as with many, like, so this is a Bayesian approach. So one is using past information, either expert knowledge that you know or what the literature suggests. But at the end of the day, it's still an estimate. It's still a predicted element. And um, I think what knowledge, past knowledge does from the literature or, or from expert uh, knowledge opinion does do, is it, is it helps you from the myriad of sensitivity analyses that you can run it helps you to, to choose which ones make sense and which ones don't make sense. So for example, some, um, you know, if we're looking at, at, at cod productivity um, or, or the productivity of any long lived species, I, I'm not sure it would make sense to set Lambda at five, you know, 
five years for land, for regime shifts. It just doesn't seem intuitively uh, sensible or, or, or logical. So I think definitely it, uh, expert knowledge and the literature can help us to delineate or, or constrain what are likely to be reasonable estimates of lambda, but I don't think they prevent us from doing the necessary sensitivity analyses. Right, and I'd be curious if you could use what you've learned to um, to um, for for maybe populations with uh, that are data poor. You know what I mean? Like for those parameters that you get from maybe these data rich stocks or where we have lots of history. I mean, of course, that's what Bayesian stats and what all this can be used for. But yeah, it's 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 another thing that you can use for. Yeah. So quite honestly, I I, I think, you know, you're, you're raising your, a great point about data poor fisheries and data poor situations. And to me, this is this is a, a such a fantastic area of research um, in in an applied context is how can we improve methods um, for assessing uh, data poor stocks, data poor fisheries, data poor species? And I think there's a lot of um, a lot that can be used and incorporated from this kind of technique. All right. So we have a question first from Aaron Adamak. He says, "I'm wondering if you looked into potential role of Capelin collapse and subsequent lack of recovery has played in Atlantic salmon in uh, the cod regime shift." Uh, no, the answer is no. Um, I think one of the challenges with Capelin is um, finding long. Well, two, the biggest challenge is, is uh, time series, is a reliable time series of, of, of Capelin. I think our knowledge of Capelin is kind of spotty. Um, I would suggest, I would offer that uh, perspective. Others will perhaps. Uh, have a, a different perspective, a different opinion, but I think it has. It's a fair comment that it has been somewhat difficult to um, to reliably and confidently um, quantify temporal changes in, in Capelin over time. I think we can do like order of magnitude changes, uh, but more detailed temporal changes have been a bit challenging. So the short answer is no. Great, um, and I. Our next question is from Bill Monavecki. Uh, you can go ahead and unmute yourself if you want to. Hi, um, hi, uh, Jeff. Can you hear me? Ah, hi, Bill. How you doing? I'm doing real good. How are you? Good, uh, Je Jeff. Uh, I just want to ask a question about the um, the salmon um, at sea survival. Um, I mean, those are those. They look like those could be associated with aquaculture. Um, you know, low sites. I mean, Con River, for example, good sites. You know, north coast of Newfoundland. Um, so I presume that any involvement of a post smolt going out of the river that could be an immediate trouble because there's you know an open sea pen there. I mean, obviously that's at sea mortality. Correct. I mean, and it might not be, and, and could it be anything not beyond that? I guess that's really my question. I, I just worry so much about the aquaculture interventions, but I don't know. What do you think about that? Well, I think, you know, if I had to make a, a sort of an expert judgment, or, or, you know, which we're all asked to do, um, that, and I think most salmon biologists would, would agree that many salmon biologists would look at that early post smolt period as being the most important um, period for the at sea survival or mortality of salmon. In other words, when they're relatively small, 10 to 15 centimeters, they are grouped together as a, as a school, which makes them vulnerable. And um, they're small, they're relatively small compared to many other uh, prey. Um, so almost certainly those first few months of life are the most vulnerable. I think, I think personally, you're right to, to look at aquaculture. It's, it's, it's pretty clear. I think, I, I think it's fairly clear that where you have a concentration of aquaculture, salmon aquaculture sites, uh, you typically do not have robust um, salmon populations associated with them. Uh, so I think objectively, one cannot possibly discount the hypothesis that the trends in Con River survival, uh, salmon survival, uh, 
that, that one could not possibly objectively discount the hypothesis that it's attributable to the high density of aquaculture uh, for all kinds of reasons, whether it's disease related, uh, interbreeding related, and so on. Um, so objectively, one could not discount that. And I think th this is what this analysis I was uh, drawing attention, or showing today draws attention to is, uh, is, a, is a greater attention today on local, more regional or smaller scale uh, stressors. You're yeah, right, Jeff. Yeah, thanks. And uh, great talk. I, I just, you know, I mean, might there not be some situations when these um, sites are removed in some instances that we get, you know, a before after kind of assessment that, uh, I mean, some of them are being removed, some of them will be removed. Um, and that might that might give us a, a more direct intervention to uh, asking the question about at sea survival and that actual, you know, that component of it. It might, although thinking back to what I was saying about cod, it kind of depends on how low uh, some of these populations have fallen. As Brian Dempson will tell us, there's very few salmon returning to the cond compared to what it was 30, 40 years ago. So this is that other element that always worries me is we can talk about things bouncing back when threats have been removed, but it very much does depend on the magnitude of the condition. Okay, thanks a lot, Jeff. Great talk. Great talk. All the best. Thanks, Bill. All the best. Um, if you have a couple more minutes, we have a we have a couple more questions. Um, Dr. Hutchings. Yes, I, I do. <laughs> okay, yeah. So our next one's from Arno. Hi. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, in the first part, you you know you had the conclusion about the sensitivity to environmental change of population uh, is related to how low the population size here is. And there is also that idea of a truncated size structure, you know, in population and how uh, population with trun truncated size structure will be more sensitive to, to uh, climate change and, you know, changing environment. So, of course, they are highly correlated often because when we fish, we tend to fish a bigger one. So we have smaller size, but we also have truncated population. But I was Wondering what's your, I mean, what's your opinion on like if we manage somehow, let's say for example, a lobster fishery, you put back the big one, and if we manage to preserve some of the big one and somewhat preserve the, the population size, size structure, how will that play versus you know population size into sensitivity to environmental change? Yeah, so great point, and uh, I, I think you've identified a, a really important another important element that I did not mention. And that is the not just the reduction in population size, but the truncation in size structure. I think it very much depends on the life history of the species in question. You mentioned lobster. I was talking about cod. These are long-lived organisms. And one thing of linking uh, a size structure uh, to population viability is through the idea of a bet hedging strategy. And the principle simply being that the the long that uh, in order for populations to persist, some populations, some species are dependent on having multiple reproductive events before they die. And that's a and cod, there's very good reason to think that cod is a bet hedging species, and that if you truncate its longevity from 20 years to 10 years, um, it will have consequences for its ability to handle or deal with naturally occurring environmental variability. That's what bed, hed bed hedging strategies, of course, are, are intended uh, to do in the first place, is to deal with the variance um, in, in, in fitness generated by the variance in the environment. So in that sense, if you reduce the, if you truncate the size structure, you are truncating the, if you will, the um, the ability of populations to recover your ability because you're reducing their ability to um, uh, to resist natural environmental change. So this is one of the kind of the problems, longstanding issues of, say, stock assessment methodology that focuses primarily on weight and doesn't uh, think about age structure so much, they tend to be, you know, all the spawners are lumped into a spawning stock biomass um, 
box, uh, but yeah, the, the size structure element, uh, one probably needs in many long-lived species to recover the size structure before you're going to recover a meaningful ability to, to deal with uh, environmental, stochastic environmental change. A long-winded answer, but I like the question. Thank you. Jin, you had a question? Oh, hi. Hi, Jeff. Uh, it's a great talk. Um, I'm really interested in the uh, spatial synchrony part that you mentioned. Uh, you mentioned that species um, respond to, uh, over large scale, respond to common um, trigger, basically. I wonder um, what is the appropriate scale for looking at spatial synchronies, especially when species are moving over um, very large geographic area, even mixing stocks uh, for, for fish. So I wonder if you could comment on that. Yes. So at, at, at what spatial scale would one look at or where would one look? Yeah, like appropriate scale at stock yeah. level or division. So for, for Atlantic salmon, what people have often done, and, and uh, Kevin Friedland and Dave Redden uh, did a lot of this work. Um, in the 1990s in particular, looking in the Labrador Sea. Uh, so again, thinking about where are salmon likely to be spatially uh, overlapping uh, with each other uh, from different populations. And there was a lot of really good work there to uh, look at um, multivariate correlates of the environment based on mainly temperature, but also a few other things. Um, and for a while, those correlations seemed to hold up. It seemed that the conditions in the in in the overwintering grounds were correlated with with trends in numbers of returning adults. So the, one of the questions I raised towards the end of the talk is that might well have been an important trigger or stressor at that time, but is it still today? And 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 the reason I mention that is there's a paper in PNAS published last year dealing with the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And, and what, the, what these uh, researchers found is that the Pacific, the strength of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation as a climate index um, was very, seems to have been very useful in predicting patterns or explaining uh, patterns of productivity de decades ago. But currently, in the last 10 or 20 years, doesn't seem to be um, as important or whether it's because the index is the climate's not as important or, or the index is just not capturing uh, things the way it used to. Anyway, it got me thinking about the fact that we tend to focus on particular stresses, um, but we don't, we sometimes forget that those, the magnitude of those stresses can change over time and the relative importance can change over time. But that's from a spatial scale perspective. I think for salmon in Canada, that's where one would look and in, Nor in um, Europe, one would look at the Norwegian Sea is where a lot of people look. So basically, find that area of greatest spatial overlap and focus one study there. But that would be well worth a returning to and revisiting, I think, today. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. All right. I I think that's it for questions. Um, thank you so much for the talk today, Dr. Hutchings, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Have a great Wednesday and stay safe out there. Hopefully we'll see you next week. Great, thank you, Colin.